Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Justin Zaramba. Uh, today with NJ Cannabis Insider and Advanced 360, we're gonna be putting on a fantastic show uh, called Cannabis Reform 2020, America's Growing Pains and Possibilities. Our 90 minute program is broken into two segments, our keynote speaker and two panels. Thanks to our local sponsor in New Jersey, the B. Gill Group, a government affairs, public relations, and digital communications firm that has been front and center on the development of the Garden State's effort to expand and improve the existing medical cannabis program while also supporting uh, sensible, highly regulated adult use uh, cannabis. NJ Cannabis Insider is a weekly industry trade journal produced by NJ.com, covering the politics, policies, and people shaping the industry locally and nationally. Find us at njcannabisinsider.biz. Today, we're excited to bring with uh, what we do to a larger audience in collaboration with Advanced 360. Thank you to both teams at NJ Cannabis Insider and Advanced 360 for making this happen. Before I introduce our keynote, I've got a couple housekeeping items. If you're tuning in today, be sure to let us know in the Zoom chat where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear from you. And if you'd like to see all of the speakers on the screen at the same time, be sure to hit gallery view on the top right of your screen. For this event, we've created a networking space on LinkedIn where you can connect with Cannabis Insider journalists and people interested in growing their cannabis business networks. Look for Advanced 360 Cannabis Insider Group and request admission. We'll also drop the link in the chat space here. If you've been following federal cannabis reform, our keynote should be a very familiar face. Kino became the chairman of the Rules Committee in the House of Representatives. Pete Sessions served in that role and blocked every piece of cannabis legislation from moving to the floor of the House. Suffice to say, Congressman Jim McGovern of the 2nd Congressional District of Massachusetts has been far more engaged on cannabis reform. Without further ado, I'd like, like to welcome Congressman McGovern. Thank you so much for joining us today, Congressman. I think he's coming on in a sec. How's that? Hi, Congressman. You hear me? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you, Justin. I appreciate it. And, uh, and good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you for having me. You know, when I was invited to address you all today, uh, accepting it was kind of a no-brainer for me, uh, not only because I've gotten to know and work with many of you over the years, uh, but because we are in an extraordinary, we are in an extraordinary time uh, in our country right now. Uh, people are rising up and demanding that we fix uh, the broken status quo in a way that we haven't seen in this country for many, many years. Frankly, it fills me with hope because I believe that's the only way meaningful long-term change happens from the outside in. Uh, it's why I've participated in protests and marches my entire life uh, from before I was elected to Congress and including uh, during my time in Congress. Uh, I've demanded that our country end wars and feed the hungry. I've, I've participated in sit-ins on the House floor to, to demand legislation to combat gun violence. And I've hugged grieving family members who have lost loved ones to gun violence and police brutality. I've always believed that if you sit on, if you sit on your hands and just wait for change, uh, that change probably will never, ever come. Uh, it takes action. So you all have seen this firsthand when it comes to our federal policies regarding cannabis. How long were you told to hurry up and wait until the time was right for Congress to debate our nation's policies toward cannabis? Year after year after year after year. I certainly saw it. Uh, I've had a front row seat in the Rules Committee. I was elected to Congress in 1996 and was appointed to the committee in 2001. For those who might be unfamiliar, the Rules Committee is, is like the traffic cop of Congress. It sets the terms for debate and amendments on most legislation that comes to the floor. It has immense power to either allow debate on an issue or stop it uh, from happening entirely. It could either be a forum to help uh, advance uh, good causes and to in, encourage debate, or it could be the graveyard for good legislation. And for many of my years on the committee, I served under Republican leadership that refused to allow debate on virtually any amendment involving cannabis. It didn't matter if they had the votes to defeat something that they didn't like. They didn't even want to talk about it. Uh, there wasn't a single cannabis-related amendment made in order in the 112th, 113th, or 114th Congress. Not one. The only one made in order last Congress was an amendment to eradicate illegal grow operations on national forest system land. 
it was really mind boggling. I saw what was happening in the real world over the years, how medical cannabis was truly helping people battling illness, how cannabis accounted for over half of all drug arrests in this country, and how you're nearly four times more likely to be arrested for cannabis uh, if you're black in America. And then I saw what was happening uh, in the Capitol under Republican leadership. Absolutely nothing. I tell people sometimes working in Washington then was like living in the twilight zone. Uh, our country has been at a crisis point with our drug policies for a very, very long time. The war on drugs has been a disaster for generations now. I remember, I remember calling to decriminalize cannabis in my earliest days in Congress. I've pushed for medicinal use for just, as about, for about just as long. But yet, the committee that had power to actually allow Congress to do something about it, to vote on these issues, enforce a change, didn't even allow a simple debate uh, under the Republicans. So I guess to them, having power meant the ability to say no. Uh, but I've always taken a different approach. You know, before I was elected to Congress, uh, I worked for uh, a, one of my mentors, former Rules Committee Chairman Congressman Joe Moakley of Boston. You know, something he said decades ago has always st stuck with me. He told me how to some people having power meant the ability to say no, but to him having power meant the ability to say yes. I've never forgotten it. I've always, uh, and I've always promised myself that I, if I ever got the chance to chair the Rules Committee, that I would put that uh, adage into action. Now, I'm about a year and a half into my chairmanship now, and I'm proud to come before you and say that the days of blocking debate on our nation's cannabis policies are over. The House debated more amendments on cannabis policy last year than it did during my entire 20 years in Congress. Uh, not only that, we have also passed a landmark bill that my friend uh, Congressman Perlmutter of Colorado uh, initiated to allow cannabis related businesses in states with existing regulatory stru structures to access the banking system. This is what happens when you allow the world's greatest deliberative body to actually deliberate and debate. Uh, that shouldn't be a radical idea, but let's be honest, these changes didn't happen because you waited long enough. They happened because the American people got tired of waiting and they demanded action. Uh, they wanted their government at all levels to tackle the problems they saw uh, right out their front door. In a, in a world where police were arresting those with a tiny amount of cannabis and treating them like drug kingpins. Now, I know you all came in part to hear me speak today, but I, I wanna thank all of you because so many of you have changed the politics on these issues and you have paved the way for this action. You know, I'm often reminded that the most enduring characteristic of our democracy is that the power of the people is always more important than the people who are in power. We've seen that time and time again over the years. Your voices have made a real difference. And we've seen it uh, in just the last few months as Americans came together in the wake of George Floyd's death to fight against systemic racism and police brutality in our communities. Now we can no longer allow issues of systemic racism to be separated out from our policy on cannabis. We know that decades into the, the so-called war on drugs, our nation's cannabis laws are being disproportionately used to lock up people of color. We know that racist drug policies have created a school to prison pipeline and resulted in laws being unfairly applied based on the color of your skin. So the question is, what are we gonna, are we gonna do about it? So the House has passed a bill to address some of these issues, but we shouldn't be naive. We know that we're up against, uh, what we, we know that what we're up against in the Senate uh, and in this current White House. Now, we may not um, make all these changes to our laws this year, but make no mistake, change is coming. In America, some leaders may turn a deaf ear at first, uh, and they may get away with it for a little while, but the will of the people uh, will eventually be heard. And we've seen it on so many issues. And so I hope that you keep holding elected officials' feet to the fire, because this should only be the beginning of our work. As important as this progress has been, I don't want, I don't want to just talk. I'm not happy only introducing and discussing big changes. I want to get reform signed into law. Now we need to make Congressman Perlmutter's Safe Banking Act the law of the land. We need to decriminalize and deschedule cannabis in this country. And we need restorative justice in this country. 
Uh, we need to expunge the records of those who have been convicted of cannabis offenses. And we need to help communities of color that have been adversely impacted by the failed war on drugs. We are closer than we have ever, ever been before. And I believe that we can seize this moment and make these reforms sooner rather than later. It may take another year and another Senate and another president, uh, but I believe the change is coming. And the progress that we've made uh, in this Congress, I think, is proof of that. And I'll promise you this. If you keep pushing for change from the outside, I'll keep pushing for change from the inside in the Capitol. So I, I am here to, to basically tell you that things are beginning to change. Um, and I'm here to say thank you because they're changing uh, not by accident. They're changing because like-minded people, like many of you on this call, have come together and demanded that change. Uh, and so we, uh, we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. And I look forward to working with you in the weeks, months, and, uh, and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. Yeah, I'm curious. I'd love to get your insight on a few uh, questions before we uh, see sure. if we get some audience questions. But in what ways have you seen the pandemic uh, that's currently afflicting really the world, uh, and especially in the United States, how has that shifted the conversation with respect to cannabis? Well, I mean, I think most notably, um, many states have classified medical cannabis as an essential service during this pandemic. Uh, I think uh, that's focused a lot of people on its benefits uh, from a medical perspective and, and dealing with things like anxiety. Uh, but uh, these decisions, I hope, will add urgency to reforms that we clearly need to make on the federal level uh, surrounding policies toward, uh, me toward medical cannabis. Uh, uh, but um, I think that's just you know, one of the ways I think this pandemic has, uh, has kind of, uh, I think, uh, lifted up this conversation. So earlier this year, the House unveiled a COVID stimulus bill, uh, including uh, a bill from uh, Congressman Perlmutter uh, with language from the Safe Banking Act. Do you expect the, uh, the industry to see any relief with respect to and financing this year? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to hope, I, I hope so. I mean, as you pointed out, my, my fellow Rules Committee member, Ed Perlmutter, uh, uh, his bill was included in the HEROES Act. Um, and, um, you know, it was, his bill is called the Safe Banking Act. Uh, it also passed separately uh, in the House uh, with an overwhelming bipartisan majority, again, due to the work that so many people who are on this call, um, you know, put into this issue. Uh, unfortunately, um, it seems to have gone over to the Senate uh, to die in Mitch McConnell's graveyard um, uh, with hundreds of other uh, House pass bills. Uh, and, you know, look, I, I mean, we, you know, we have a, a couple of weeks left uh, in July before there's an August recess. Then we're back in September for a few more weeks and then it's election time. And so there's not a lot of time, you know, to move out. We're still waiting for the Senate to act on the HEROES Act. It's possible that they may come back with something and we can, you know, try to insist that um, uh, Congressman Perlmutter's language is part of that. Uh, I hope that we can do that. But if not, we, you know, we're going to, you know, we may have to wait until, um, until we get a different Senate and a, and a different president. Uh, uh, but, um, but I think we're getting close to the point where, well, let me put it this way. I think we're at a point where what Congressman Perlmutter has proposed is not controversial. I don't believe most Americans don't think it's controversial. Uh, but uh, we're waiting to get some signal from the Senate whether they might be more sympathetic to taking this as part of the uh, HEROES Act. Yeah. I appreciate that. I mean, you know, that, that is, Everybody has generally, especially in the cannabis industry, that, you know, there's been generally a dim view of what will happen with respect to uh, Mitch McConnell's Senate right now. So you, you believe that you know, ultimately reform is going to be contingent upon a change in uh, overall change in leadership and makeup of the Senate and the White House? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. Look, I mean, um, as I said, I mean, uh, the Safe Banking Act, Safe Banking Act had bipartisan support, overwhelmingly bipartisan support in the House which makes you wonder why the hell were they blocking it uh, when, when the Republicans were in charge in the previous Congress? I mean, it was a pretty strong vote. And, um, you know, and I think, the, and there were Republicans in the Senate who I know uh, support it as well. And yet it, we, they can't seem to get a, a time to bring it to the floor or even to incorporate it in a, you know, in a bill like the HEROES Act. So look, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of this, uh, you know, I, I, you know, 
I think we can find common ground, ground on cannabis reform, uh, but uh, the majority leader, uh, Mr. McConnell, has shown no willingness to even negotiate. Um, and um, so, you know, again, we're, we're not going to give up before the year is, is up. We're going to keep on trying to figure out whether there's a way to be able to get him to relent. But if not, it may, it may take a, you know, if, if not a different Senate, I hope there's a different Senate, uh, but in, a, a different president who may insist uh, that this be part of whatever package uh, comes before him. Okay. Right. As you noted in, uh, in your opening, black and brown folks are almost four times more likely to be prosecuted, arrested and prosecuted for cannabis possession or, uh, than someone who is white. So given the nationwide, especially in, in, the, in the past you know, few months, uh, the nationwide push for systemic reforms around policing, what is, what is, the con is Congress doing to remedy the, these disparities? Well, you know, some of us, uh, well, we passed this police reform uh, bill, uh, which d does a lot of issues, which addresses a lot of issues from qualified immunity to transparency in terms of policing. Um, but many of us, Felt that we ought to, we we needed to do something on you know on, on cannabis in terms of addressing the fact that so many people um, you know have criminal records, uh, particularly in communities of color, as a result of of, uh, of being arrested um, because of possession of cannabis. And so you know uh, you know our deal is that we want um, you know we want it um, not only decriminalized, descheduled. We want to be able to expunge people's records. Uh, of any criminality, um, you know, uh, the Judiciary Committee, Congressman Nadler is working on something that would do that. My hope is that we can, you know, that that, that would move forward. Um, in fact, uh, you know, many of us, when Congressman Promutter's bill was being discussed, insisted that we get a commitment that the House would take up uh, that bill as well. And my hope is that uh, we will do it. But, um, um, but it, you know, it's important um, because, as I said in my opening remarks. Uh, these issues of uh, racial justice and systemic racism and um, and cannabis re and cannabis reform are all kind of interlinked here, uh, and so that ought to be part of our our, our ask of, of Congress uh, uh, as they as we move forward with other reforms. Thank you. Uh, here, you know, again, for for those in the industry, the one of the the biggest challenges and hurdles for a lot of operators is the IRS tax code two eighty eight. Um, which takes a significant chunk out of, uh, out of finances that, that they have and, you know, still effectively treats them under, under federal guidelines as a criminal or, uh, enterprise. So where, where is Congress going with this and, and providing reforms or, you know, repealing this with, with respect to uh, the cannabis industry? Well, there is a bill, H.R. 2093, called the States Act, uh, that would amend the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 to exempt individuals and corporations in states who are in compliance with U.S. state, territory, and D.C. laws from federal enforcement. I think it's a, it, it's a common sense measure. Uh, and again, um, you know, I, I would like to Hope that that is also uh, one of the priorities on the agenda. And certainly, if it comes before the Rules Committee in any form, we will uh, accelerate its movement to the House floor um, and even entertain it as an amendment, if it in fact to another bill, if it's if it, if it's if it's germane. Um, as you said, it's a common sense. It's common sense. But are you expecting common sense to prevail in the, the current political climate? Uh, well, common sense hasn't has not prevailed in the current political uh, climate, uh, and I always tell people that uh, this may shock some that intelligence is not always a prerequisite for serving in Congress. Uh, but the bottom line is that look, the states are way ahead of the federal government, um, and the federal government now has to play catch up. And on a lot of issues, it's sometimes the reverse. Here, I mean, if you know, if if you know, members of Congress, members of the Senate, Democrats, Republicans, Republicans listen to what's happening in their states and listen to their constituents. This is common sense. Um, now, I think, look, we, you know, we have a couple of problems here. One is the Senate Majority Leader, who is a problem. I don't quite understand, uh, you know, why, but um, nonetheless, he's a problem on this stuff. So that complicates things. The other thing, quite frankly, uh, is that we're, we're in the middle of this pandemic and, uh, and, for, and, and Congress is operating, um, you know, in a hybrid way, sometimes in person, sometimes remotely. Um, and, you know, our, it takes us forever now to even cast a vote. 
Uh, so sometimes, you know, where, you know, the, the ability to kind of do a whole bunch of stuff is, is somewhat has to be compressed. But look, I, I think that there's support, again, not only for this, but for before, before as I mentioned before, Congressman Nadler's bill, I, I you know, I, I, I think the support is there. <clears throat> the issue is to schedule it and to move it forward. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I think uh, we're proving that we can pass things in the House. And that's a good thing. But you know what? Um, but if we can't even get it taken up in the Senate, and if we can't get the White House to insist that it be part of some package that comes before them, then, you know, yeah, it's nice. And, it, you know, we're, we're showing our strength. But I'm interested in results. I know you're interested in results. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, you know, introducing bills, debates, in and of themselves are, are good, but I want it to be more than therapy. I want it to be that we're in right. fact, you know, we're, we're changing the law um, in a meaningful way that will impact businesses and individuals all throughout this country. Okay. Thank you. Do you see a pathway forward for federal legalization in the near term? Um, I think it's it, talk to me after the election. Um, and if and if the election work, turns out the way I hope it is, the answer is yes. Um, you know, again, I mean, you know, we passed Congressman Perlmutter's very modest, common sense, you know, uh, safe banking act that again, based on the votes in the House and based on, you know, what I'm hearing from rank and file members of the Senate shouldn't be controversial. And yet we are stalled. <laughs> so, so I think, um, you know, we can remove some roadblocks in terms of people who decide, you know, who are, who are blocking scheduling these things. I think that, uh, that uh, you, know, we, that, uh, you know, there's a lot more we can do. So let's say that there is a change in, that, that ends up happening in November. Uh, and specifically, you know, there's, there's a change in the White House. Joe, Joe Biden has not historically been uh, a proponent when it comes to legalization, and it's taken a, a significant amount of time for him to evolve his position. Now, uh, in you know, combination with the Sanders team is putting together a decriminalization sort of platform. Uh, do you expect him to go further than this to continue evolving, or is this uh, about as far as far as we can expect him to budge? I hope that he continues to evolve, um, but clearly, he's evolving in the right direction. Um, but you know, just as important um, is the fact that Congress, um, you know, is uh, is there, and um, and so I, I you know, and, I, and my sense is that um, you know, if, if Joe Biden is president, he's going to listen to the Democratic House, and hopefully a Democratic Senate, and um, you know, we're going to make some significant uh, strides forward. Again, again, I, you know, the 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 reality is um, is that the states are way ahead of Congress, and you know, blocking even the most modest measures uh, that have been put forward, you know, I think demonstrate a certain amount of tone deafness um, and kind of being out of touch with where the majority of our constituents are. So I, you know, I think, uh, let me put it this way. I think if the, um, if, if, if things shift in a way that I hope that they shift, uh, then I hope that all of you will be very aggressive in moving forward your priorities, and I think you'll find a lot, a lot, a a, a, a more receptive audience um, in the Senate and the White House than you do now. All right. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. I really appreciate your time, and thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. All the best. Be safe, everybody. Thank you. Bye. For those of you just joining us, this is Cannabis Reform 2020, America's Growing Pains and Possibilities, hosted by Advanced 360 and NJ Cannabis Insider. Each week, NJ Cannabis Insider brings high-quality journalism about the politics, policies, and people shaping the industry to its subscribers. Become an insider today at njcannabisinsider.biz. Uh, for those of you just joining us, please uh, check in with the chat window and let us know where you're tuning in from. We're going to start our first panel now that uh, we've wrapped up our keynote with, con uh, with the congressman. And I'd like to introduce Toy Hutchinson, the senior advisor to the governor of Illinois for cannabis control, and Karen O'Keefe, the director of state policies for marijuana policy project. Thank you, Toy. Thank you, Karen, for joining us today. Thank you. Ha thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks. Oh, there we go.
There we go. <laughs> there you go. So 2020, uh, you know, everyone thought it was going to be a banner year for cannabis legalization, but <laughs> we've had the reality, uh, a reality check in the form of a pandemic, uh, economic hardship, uh, civil rights strife, uh, all of which has proceeded to take a lot of the oxygen out of the room when it comes to talking about cannabis, and, uh, in, especially federally. Uh, you know, when, when looking at the states, wh who still holds promise for enacting significant reform this year? Karen, if you'd like to start us off. Sure. So um, although it's not going to be as great of a year as we expected for the number of states legalizing, there are still a lot that are in the queue and that are possible. In short, most of the states that had legislatures that were expected to take up cannabis legalization or medical cannabis kind of stalled because of the coronavirus, but there are still a lot of states that have ballot measures that are in place. And some of those also stalled because it's very hard to collect signatures in the middle of a pandemic, but they managed in some states. So for adult use legalization, there are as many as four states that could have legalization on the ballot. It's New Jersey, where the legislature put the measure on the ballot. Mm -hmm. South Dakota, where it's already qualified for the ballot. Montana, where the campaign handed in signatures. And Arizona, where the campaign also handed in signatures. So if all of those passed, we could go from 11 to 15 legalization states this year. Then turning to medical cannabis, um, we've got South Dakota. So they'll be the first state ever to vote on both medical and adult use legalization at the same time. That's Great. qualified. Yeah. Yeah, Mississippi, which is a very deep red state, uh, qualified for the ballot too. The legislature put a competing initiative on, which is weaker and worse, but that will be on the ballot. Both will be on the ballot. And then in Nebraska, advocates turned in signatures and were hopeful they'll qualify there. And then finally in Idaho, um, they had postponed the signature drive and it had stalled out, but a separate campaign went to court and said they should be allowed to collect signatures post deadline electronically and they won. And so now the medical cannabis campaign is also hoping to do so. So if all of those qualifying pass, we could actually have four legalization states, which I believe ties the most ever passed in one here, and four medical states. There were a lot of legislative states that stalled. We still are hopeful that Vermont will upgrade their very limited uh, legalization law to allow sales, which isn't currently allowed. It's in a conference committee now. And there's a couple other states where it's not that likely but possible there could be a special session. But those are the big ones, our ballot initiatives for this year. And then next year, we're optimistic that a lot of states that stalled out this year will pick up and we'll take the issue on and pass. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, turning to the land of Lincoln, uh, earlier, <laughs> earlier this year, uh, Illinois set sales figures, uh, record, set records with uh, their sales figures uh, following uh, adult use legalization. What, you know, what trends have you seen and what, what do you think that, you know, the significant demand that you've seen uh, in Illinois uh, says about consumer and patient demand toy. Um, well, number one, thanks for being, thanks for having me on. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, one of the things I think that was surprising to most of us, we forecasted about $34 million for the fiscal year when we passed it in 2019. We just announced, um, we're, we're announcing today that we've, we've hit 52 million um, collected in taxes in the first six months of legalization. And we knew from a demand study coming in that not only could we have a much bigger and more robust program than what we're, we're limited and uh, rolling out right now, but that demand is just consistent and through the roof and recession proof and pandemic proof. Mm -hmm. Our highest totals, um, we hit a record in May and then did it again in June. And this is under large quarantine lockdown orders. Um, mm -hmm. We know, we know that there's a significant portion of the adult use space that is actually medical. And so that was uh, driven largely by our decision to make it an essential business, um, just like pharmacies and, and actually liquor stores. Like, so, so if the argument was, do you want to be taxed and regulated like alcohol, then we need to tax and regulate like alcohol. <laughs> and so it was, um, and I think part of the reason why both myself and, and our governor felt so strongly about that is because Illinois did do exactly what congressman laid out we were the first state in the country to embed those three principles how do you change the industry what do you do with the money and how do you repair how do you repair past harms 
So all of the things that we've been working on are, are, are working or rolling through those things, even with closures of court systems and, and city halls and city councils and zoning meetings stopping and all those things we've just been chugging along, trying to make sure that all three pillars of this equity argument don't get lost sight of when literally it's been COVID, 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 COVID. So it is hard to continue the conversation and keep the, sh the showcase on it. But I think the thing that I'm most excited about in terms of demand is that, um, you know, there are a lot of people who thought we should have offered way more licenses than we did, but we are like, we're not offering any more licenses until we prove that the equity measures work. Mm -hmm. And we built a stopgap into our law to say just that. We, we're going to do this on a small basis, figure out how we can constitutionally crack this nut before we offer another single license. And so it needed to be small so that we could um, so that we could really not not lose sight of really of what's at stake in here, and it, and what's at stake is that we can't normalize and legalize an industry. And when I say normalize, I really mean that. Like, people turn like only talk about black and brown people in terms of expungement and criminal justice, but turn them blind eye to the fact that there are 34 states and operators and across 11 states that are making millions of dollars on the sale right. of something that the exact same activity destroyed whole communities for generations. So it's a hard, it's a hard thing to get at, but it's, it's one where you, if you take out any pillar of the equity argument, you, the whole house comes tumbling down because you can't have one without the other. Um, and we feel really, really strongly about that. So I am you know, nervous every day, <laughs> every single day um, because the COVID things have delayed uh, the licensure here. But um, we're still on target to becoming making announcements in the next, you know, in the next in the coming weeks. So I'm just um, cautiously optimistic about laying down the gauntlet. We did that when we passed it, but it's it's got to be more than just embedding it in the statute. It has to be winning all the challenges that come after that. Which means January 1, 2020 in Illinois wasn't success. That was just the beginning of really doing the life-changing and generational landmark work that has to be done in this space. I mean, you know, equality means more than just, you know, not being prosecuted. It means economic equality and, and, and equal opportunity. So what are, what are you seeing right now with the current, you know, rollout when it comes to these equity provisions that you, you, you mentioned before? We're, we're in a, right now, we're waiting to see, like, what the high, who the high scores will be. So once we get those, that information out, then we'll know. Um, exactly where it worked and exactly where we need to fix. And that's, that's a part of our, that'll be a part of our disparity study. That'll be a part of how we, how we decide to move to the next step. We can, we know that we could have upwards of 500 dispensaries in Illinois. We're only offering 75. I cannot imagine if we had flown the floodgates wide open and then had a program that didn't work, mm -hmm. you know, like all of a sudden, because I think one of the most important things that has to happen is also protecting future market share for people to come online. And that's what we saw in multiple places. It was that, you know, now there's licenses and only the most well capitalized people can get them. And, and then if, if, we, if you do it and then equity partners and equity people come on board and they get the license space, then the, it's so hard to compete as it is with the 280E problems you mentioned, with the barriers to, barriers to access to the banking industry. There's a number of different things that we're gonna have to keep forward looking on for not only winning the license but being able to compete and hold on to it once you have it this is a ongoing very fast-paced volatile market to get into and um th those are the balances that we're all that we're all desperately trying to, to to keep our hands on and that's a again there's a reason why the industry looks the way it does everywhere in the country everywhere in the country and they're not that different than a lot of the reasons why for black and brown folks, we don't make up 20% of any industry in terms of ownership. So we have, we have historic and systemic and structural things to deal with. And it's going to take years to untangle that. It's really going to take years, but you got to keep your head down and keep moving. Because what I'm seeing now is that the one thing that keeps everybody moving is that we can see the possibilities. The possibilities are here now in a way that they had not been before. We had a existing medical industry in Illinois for six years, very little conversation outside from the outside of the advocates on the ground about how, how homogenous it was. So, I mean, the attempt, when we picked this up, we went at that first. And we said, again, three things. It's, it's gonna be about what the industry looks like. It's gonna be about what we do with that money in terms of the communities that were hit the hardest. 
And it's also about how we direct the, the, the flow of money that comes. I'm so proud that our governor did not say at the, out, at the outset that all this money was gonna go straight into our general revenue fund or to one specific thing. We have a nexus that ties directly to the people who were hurt the most at every stage of this, of, of this endeavor. Do I think it's gonna be perfect right now? No. Do I think we're in it for the long game? Damn right we are. Uh, that's, that's a great quote right there. Okay. <laughs> Um, so peeling, peeling back a little bit to, for, for a bit of a more expansive view. So, uh, Karen, love, love to get you in on this. Uh, as states have legalized, what sort of, what other growing pains have we seen uh, as, you know, both in medical and adult use states as they've gone that? And Toy, please feel free to jump in with, you know, your, your, your uh, insight from, uh, from Illinois. Yeah. So I'll start with the adult use states. It's been as varied as the states are. It really has depended on what the program they set up was and what went wrong with it. So one of the first ones was Washington State, where they started with 25% taxation at each point of transfer. So that in some cases was three different stages. That was just way too high of taxes. And so they ended up reassessing and reducing the tax burden to be more competitive with the illicit market. Uh, in Oregon, they pushed really hard to have very low burdens, barriers to entry for growers. And unfortunately, because Oregon was already supplying a lot of the country's marijuana demand, including where marijuana wasn't legal, by having everybody get legal, you ended up with way more supply than the intrastate market could, you know, could, could needed. So you ended up with a lot of people losing a lot of money because they had a lot of cannabis they'd grown and nowhere to sell it. So the state there changed. Well, nowhere to legally sell it. <laughs> nowhere to legally sell it. So it was still sold just as okay, always gotta, had been the case. We gotta be clear. <laughs> yeah, we gotta be clear about yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, obviously the problem there wasn't Oregon law. It was the law in 40 other states and federal law. So that's something that hasn't solved. You know, the Oregon legislature passed a bill saying that you know, they'll allow export once the federal government does, but the federal government hasn't. So that remains a problem and a lot of people have lost a lot of money. In California, where I live, we've had a problem because it's been a number of fronts, but um, the medical cannabis market was not regulated at all. There were no state licenses. The grow system was pretty much gray market. And so, and you had a situation where some cities like LA had kind of tolerated dispensaries at some point, sometimes they banned, it, banned them, sometimes they allowed them. And so you have literally hundreds of illegal dispensaries that are storefronts, while you have a very limited number of legal storefronts. So the consumer doesn't know what they're buying from, they've been very slow at licensing legal businesses. And so that's made it challenging to convert to a legal regulated market, as has just generally a very slow rollout throughout the state while you have this very robust illicit market um, supply. And high taxes have also been an issue there. Uh, in a lot of places, we've seen issues with local control where uh, even though voters in the state want marijuana to be legal, it ends up being illegal in much of the state. And that's been the case in California, in Colorado, and in um, Massachusetts, it has been an issue less of bans, although that's an issue too. But what has happened is they've had things called host community agreements, where essentially a city says, if you want to apply for a business here and to get our endorsement, you have to give us certain benefits. They're negotiated one-on-one, -on -one, and they've uh, really thwarted the goals of equity that were at the heart of a lot of the implementation. And they've slowed down the process for licensing. They've really reduced the number of equity applicants that got through. And I think somebody ended up in federal prison as a result because there was also some corruption. Um, so we've had a lot of challenges state by state, and every new state can kind of learn from what went wrong in other states and what went right in them, and hopefully keep on having better laws. Thank you. I think if I just wanted to, I just wanted to dovetail on that for just a, a, a small point, and it is oh. the fact that the medical the the medical market is across 34 states now. I think is it 34, so we'll, we have a chance of moving to 38 after this cycle. Um, and every legal state then, like the majority of the legal states that we have is surrounded by illegal states. So, so even when you use the argument that you want to go at the illicit market, that we really are trying to figure out how to get people into a safe, regulated market, um, a lot of times people act like there's passport control in between each state. The same thing with COVID, <laughs> like people move all over the place. And so that that is um i think something that hampers the legal states when they're trying really really hard to make a to make a, re a well-regulated market um but we know that until there's some federal action to do this across the state that's that's always going to be for it's always going to be one of the hardest things that we have to deal with 
And so I, you know, I make public safety arguments all the time that at the end of the day, you cannot, you cannot regulate that which you don't control. And that this is not just a state's argument right now. That really is an impetus that I still am blown away about the fact that the federal government is turning a blind eye to. Right. I mean, it just comes down to the you know, simple, you know, uh, constitutional law. It's interstate commerce. And that's right. That's they're right. not stopping. So that's right. You know, just putting their hands up and closing their eyes. But yes, and that this is the world of 2020. And so I'm sure we'll continue to see more things like this. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about, you know, making it easier for smaller operators to participate in the market. But by and large, multi-state operators are the norm in the cannabis space. And especially large companies like Constellation Brands are uh, making their way uh, into, into the industry. Where is there space for folks with less capitalization uh, to participate in the market? Again, um, was, it's, that's one of the biggest reasons why we need the Safe Banking Act. Um, that is one of the biggest reasons why we need federal action on this. Uh, it's sometimes when people talk about, like, um, we had a study, there was a thing that was released that said that 77% uh, of Illinois' market is controlled by six companies. I think that nationally speaking, it's like 89 or something percent of the cannabis industry is controlled by like eight or nine companies. And I liken that to, I don't really see neighborhood pharmacies very much anymore. Everybody goes to Walgreens and CVS and this entire pandemic taught us about the power of Amazon. And so it's, it's been, you know, like while, while we have a lot of focus now on the possibilities of what we can change and add and grow in the Canada space as it relates to small business, minority entrepreneurship, um, people who've been impacted the most, no matter what color you are, and impacted by the war on drugs, although we know 55% of those folks are African American. Um, it is a situation where you have systemic and structural racism running smack up into capital, capitalism or capitalism as we know it now. And it's, it's a, that makes it even harder. That makes it even harder. So one of the things we did, we created a $31 million revolving loan for access to um, startup costs. Again, and because of licensure delays, we, we got some um, timing issues that are making it so that there are people struggling right now trying to not burn through all the money that they got together to try to figure out how to get into this. Um, so it's, it is, those things are really difficult things to do, but that banking access, when you cannot use traditional financial tools, and then when you figure out how to get into the space, the, re the high cost of the regulatory structure and then the high cost of that 280E problem is like a sledgehammer to your forehead. And in this, in that space, we, that's what we need to be cognizant of, like where states can try to mediate or ameliorate some of those issues. Um, and as we, as we continue to advocate as those of us that are in the legal spaces for the, for the federal government to finally do something, like just do something. This is, we have an entire country that is operating because even if you're not ever touching the plant, if, it's, if you're not in a dispensary, you're not in a cultivator, all the companies, all the things that the industry needs around it, People who build HVAC systems, people who are working in marketing, people who sell fertilizer to the to the places that are actually you know growing in the cultivation sites. All those other ancillary businesses can also have these issues, which is why the Safe Bank Act is so common sense and ridiculously ridiculous that it hasn't passed yet. But it's it is to me um, one of it's an imperative that we keep that we keep focusing on the fact that it's hard enough to get in in the first place, and if you're small and not vertically integrated. And you have to come up with ways for those folks to, to compete. One of the ways we tried or we're trying is craft grow operations and also licensing infusion, infusion um, businesses. If you have someone who doesn't want to own a dispensary, but just makes really good cookies, like just awesome cookies, and they have a relationship then with one of those small craft grow things, all of a sudden that's, a, that's something that mirrors on a smaller, smaller plane what a vertically integrated shop looks like. We talk all the time about the, the the challenges with having some vertically integrated and the challenges of bringing the independence on. I think most people who are who operate independently know that our equity program is one of the best things to try to keep independence in this marketplace. But I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't say it's it is one of the hardest things um, to get at, and um, I've yet to hear any anybody that's done it that it worked. Like it's. You know, like right now, we're just kind of trying to, uh, we, we know that if we do everything that everybody else did, we're going to get everything that everybody else got. And um, the stakes are too high for that. And that was not meant to be a joke. That was, 
the, the stakes being high was not meant to be a joke. I, it gets too easy to like kind of use words like that and then everybody starts cracking up. Another problem with this is that when you start talking about it, there's an initial thing where people are either really wor- really nervous about having a full on for real economic conversation about this. Right. And then you have people who want to, who literally want to like draw it down to its most cynical, funny thing. Yep. And for, and for, you know, people like me that left, left the general assembly and came to the inflammation stage or people who are advocates on the ground, who've been screaming about this for years when nobody would listen for black and brown folks who've been literally destroyed by this. There's nothing funny about it. This is a real business. It's a real industry. It has real growth potential. And you cannot leave out the people who've been locked up and locked out about it from the beginning. Yeah. Thank you. Now, yeah, you know, speaking, you know, speaking to those points, and you know, I'll raise the question I brought up to the congressman before, that you know, we have, you know, the, historically, there's been a huge uh, disproportionate uh, use of policing uh, on the folks, uh, you know, you know, folks who are black and brown with respect to any sort of drug possession, but you know, especially cannabis. Um, you know, have any steps thus far, you know, th- this year, taken any serious steps for remedying this, or at least attempting to to start that that healing process? Karen, do you want to start us off, and then maybe sure. Toy? Yeah. So for the most part, so far, the legalization laws have focused on, you know, removing the criminal a- criminality of cannabis itself, making sure that the smell of cannabis can't be grounds for a search, and decriminalizing other conduct that could otherwise be criminal, like possessing a little bit over the limit, things like that. There's a Vermont bill that includes a requirement, it's the legalization of sales bill that includes a requirement that they keep data on all of the arrests and stops, uh, including racial data and the amount of contraband seized, if any, so that you can start kind of having a spotlight on any disparities there. Um, We've seen in the ACLU's report that there were fewer disparities in arrests in legalization states than in decriminalization and non-legalization states, and way fewer total arrests in legalization states. We've also seen that there's a dramatic drop in searches in the states where marijuana is legal, because Mm -hmm. officers can say they smell marijuana and then use that as a pretext to pull people over. But it doesn't solve the disparities as a whole. And I think that um, solving disparities as a whole or addressing it requires much broader reform than just marijuana because we see it in everything. We see it in traffic enforcement, mm-hmm. other drug enforcement. Mm-hmm. And I know that a lot of organizations are working really hard on recommendations for this. I saw that there was an author of a book that had some implement, some strategies that were implemented in Oakland so they could dramatically reduce all arrests and also disparities within it. One of the things she recommended is making sure that stops aren't based on intuition or suspicion and things that lead to racial profiling, but were actual based on concrete activities. Other recommendations include making sure that any officers that have a lot of complaints have action taken against them so they don't stay on the force and keep on uh, abusing their power. And I know um, there have been federal consent decrees where the DOJ under Obama and his predecessors would target um, police forces like Ferguson that had huge patterns of racial disparities in enforcement and with a federal court order require them to remedy a lot of that. Um, Those unfortunately have stopped under the Trump administration. None of them are being pursued now. But there are a lot of things that need to happen that are much broader than just marijuana. We've seen a couple of pieces included. Of course, we've seen expungement um, and, you know, decriminalization of surrounding things, but I haven't seen a lot that was tied specifically to it. But I know a lot of these states are also looking at broader policing reform uh, at the same time. Thank you. Um, we did, so we had, we found 770,000 records that would be eligible for expungement, some some com- some combination of expungement plus pardon. Um, and, and, you know, like the easy ones are when it's just a single charge by itself. It gets more complicated as they are uh, intertwined and in- tangled up in other charges. Because what we do know is that while cannabis is not a gateway drug, that distinction belongs to alcohol and cigarettes. It is a gateway conviction, as Karen just um, pointed out. And so we set a timeline on a benchmark for five years to, you know, outwards to get through untangling all that, which shows you how pervasive it actually is in the state. So we wanted to be forward thinking as well as take a look backwards as to how, I don't care whether you want to you want to be in the business or not, you need to be able to live your life. It's a second chance at life. And so we also um, take some of those dollars from point of sale and we put it towards legal aid 
um, entities whose job it is to help find people who are eligible for this relief. This, and and again, it's it is. We have 102 counties in the state of Illinois. We have some good state's attorneys. We have an excellent one in Cook County who leaned in and helped us draft the criminal um, justice reform pieces of the bill in, in state's attorney Kim Fox. Um, but we have a lot of state's attorneys across the state. Illinois is way more purple than people think when you just think about Chicago. There's a lot of red counties who do not believe in this at all. So one of the things we also did was try to remove the ability for state's attorneys to block block it when you, when you actually go through the, the motions of of beginning the expungement process. I think another thing that we probably all need to do is that because you see this in so many different areas, it's trying to figure out how to treat the whole person. So if someone comes and has, they find out that they have a cannabis conviction that can be expunged, you're gonna find out they may have some other things that, that could be sealed or expunged as well. You really, it opens the door to really changing somebody's life. Um, and it's why it's such a critical part of what this is. It's like. Um, you can't get a job anywhere if you can't, if, if you still have to check that box on a job application and you're still not eligible to get a student loan or you fall into the, um, the housing um, restrictions in terms of arrests and things like that in terms of, of signing a lease. If you can't have some, if you don't have some place to live and you can't get, you can't go to school and you can't get a job, it doesn't matter whether or not you're looking at one day I want to go into the industry, you can't live your life right then. So this, the fact that this is happening piecemeal across the states is at once unfortunately exciting but also a travesty because um they're so uniquely tied criminal justice reform drug policy reform and a case study in how you reinvest the communities that were hit hard because in those communities where people actually live they're not just those aren't just like numbers on a spreadsheet those are neighborhoods and churches and families and if my nephew's record is clear. The whole family can be impacted by that. The, even, even with parole violations, like you're not allowed to be around anybody else with a parole violation. Well, if you have whole neighborhoods and whole blocks that have, that have been over-targeted and over-policed, then it's, it's, almost, it's next to impossible to break through that web of, of a web of just structural things that keep you where you are. And, and we have to always remember that systems produce what they're designed to produce. The system we have right now, the criminal justice system we have right now, was designed to do exactly what it's doing. So the only time to change it, the only way to, to change the results is to change the system. And right now it's only happening state by state by state. We got to keep present here. Thank you. I had more questions, but we have a, we have a lot of interest from, from our audience members. So I want to give them some time before we end moving on to the next panel. So uh, I have a question here from Sean. Uh, how can I, uh, what's it? How can I learn more about the Illinois social equity initiatives and how to best incorporate them into my business plan? Is there, uh, you have a, is there a website in, uh, for, for the, uh, the cannabis uh, control program in, in, in Illinois where you might be able to get more, more information on this? Yeah, you can also, yes. One, it's, it's actually spelled out in the application, which you can view on, you can view that online. You can Google cannabis in Illinois cannabis, mm -hmm. and it'll pop you to either agriculture or our Department of Financial Regulations that'll show you what those pieces are. There's been an extensive amount written on it. You literally can Google Illinois Social Equity Program, and there'll be a boatload of articles that come up and say exactly what it is we've been doing. It's, we, just, we just passed the year, year, one year landmark of, of signing the bill. Mm -hmm. The law has now been legal for six months, and so now we move into the phase of seeing what actually happens with, mm -hmm. with the licenses before anything else can go forward. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And uh, one, one more from Sean. Have there in, been any supply chain issues in Illinois so far? Oh, we definitely saw, we definitely saw blips in the supply chain, as, as most states do. Yeah. You can't really forecast the demand. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no way anybody could have put their, wrapped their brains around a global pandemic happening. Mm -hmm. um, and because we, because we didn't grow, so one of the arguments was, uh, give out a whole bunch more cultivation sites. What we were afraid of, though, was if we did that under the if we did that under the system that we had, we would we wouldn't have any equity measures built in there. So we we see some of these things starting to smooth out, but it's definitely because of the way the industry operates. Something that you have to be you have to be almost two steps ahead of the game. We got a lot of really really smart people whose whose whole goal it is is to get around me. So, so it is, it's it, supply issues will always, will always, um, 
uh, be a problem until we reach a mature market. And, and so I just have to keep reminding people that this is six months old. It's just six months old. So we, we were expecting some issues. Uh, I have another question here uh, from uh, Mon Cherie. Uh, uh, toy tie breaking rules should be in place by September. When will applicants be notified? Also, for those who won outright in the region, when will they be notified uh, with respect to the dispensary side of things? If we if we know someone who won outright in their region, that'll be they'll be notified as soon as we it's like it's soon before, they'll they'll be they'll be notified immediately. Mm -hmm. um, if there's ties though, we can't, we can't note, we can't say anything until we actually have a legal mechanism to break the tie. Mm -hmm. So the minute, the day that happens is the day everybody will be notified and applicants themselves, if they know they're moving to the tiebreaker thing, they will be, they will be informed by the department as soon as possible. Okay. And uh, one, one more from Mount Sherry. Uh, should there be any other delays in Illinois? Where will that be communicated? Uh, the only way we can is, is we'll, we'll issue it by press release and, um, but I'm not anticipating any more significant delays. I'm really not. This is, we're, we're nearing the end. Knock on wood, right? <laughs> I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I said, knock on wood, right? Knock on, God, knock on wood. And so if there's anything that keeps me up at night is worrying about people who, um, believe in this so much and have done everything they possibly can to get that thing in and try to have a shot at this and, Nobody wants this, wants these things awarded more than me right now, except for possibly the applicants. All right. Uh, I think uh, I have one more question here from an audience member. Uh, I think we can uh, put that to both you and Karen. Uh, how do you create a system that balances equity, economic benefits, and community health? It appears that commercial interests outweigh public health issues, and these issues are of concern for non-legalized states currently. So I'm I think thinking it's yeah. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead, Karen. Go, go. I talked a lot. So, go ahead. Every state's working really hard to do that. Um, a lot of the states I work in personally are state legislative states and to get the votes, you know, we've only passed through two state legislatures ever so far and a big focus is public health. So they have things like limiting the service sizes, making sure that none of the gummies can look like animals or cartoons. I know in Washington state, which was initiative, they had to have all the flavors even be things like ginger and things that don't apply, appeal as much to children. Um, it's so different than alcohol and tobacco in that this is something that's federally illegal, has been illegal in the states. So the way they're being implemented in states are very, very, very conscious of public health. In a lot of the states, there are handouts like you would get when you go to get a prescription drug that tell you about the risks. There's usually a community education campaign. I know there's a public education campaign in Illinois. Um, social justice and racial equity is absolutely essential. A lot of states are kind of being laboratory of democracy. As you can see in Illinois, they're having um, a percent of the points that you can get are for social equity applicants. They have funding for it. There is a training program through community colleges, I believe. There are a whole bunch of different things in the Connecticut bill that we're working on that have a different approach. They would have um, a head start for the social equity applicants. So it would essentially be free market, but you can go first if you're a social equity applicant. Each applicant would have to have a list of things that they would um, have to do. They'd have to have a diversity plan for their hiring, for their management and for ownership uh, and community benefits. So there's a whole lot of things that states are doing in all three of these. And all I, all I was gonna say was that you have to tie it. it they, one has to be with the other. It's like the, here, like our revolving loan program, it was funded by the initial operators so that we could start. Um, we knew we didn't have money in our budget to be able to do that on our own. We had to have it come from the existing operators, which was part of the price they paid for the, for the fact that they started first. And then you had, when we took the point of sale, like we took the taxation and, and compared it to alcohol so that it was um, the, the stronger, the strength, sort of just like hard liquor is more expensive in terms of taxation than, than beer and wine. So we took that model and then said that 25% of all these dollars are going to go to our, what we call our R3 program. Um, and that's our reinvest. And it, that's, that's the reinvestment piece to these communities. Because any place you see high, high arrests and high rates of returning home, you also see underemployment and undereducation. It's part of it's part of what makes then what happens to these communities so structural. It's all it's all built into the structural at every turn. Right. So um, instead of that, those dollars going to our general revenue fund, which generally are the first things to get cut, it's tied to the sale of the product for whom the the demonization of the product destroyed the community in the first place. Mm -hmm. So one has to go with the other. Oh, seems like a very eloquent solution. I, I wish you the best of luck with it. Pray hard. <laughs>
Toy, Aaron, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you both today. I really appreciate it. I think we had some really good conversation. Thanks, everybody. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And if you're just joining us, uh, uh, we're gonna be moving on to our second panel, our last one for the day. Uh, this is Cannabis Reform 2020, America's Growing Pains and uh, Possibilities, hosted by Advanced 360 and NJ Cannabis Insider. Um, NJ Cannabis Insider brings you high, high quality journalism each and every week, focused on the politics, policies, and people shaping the industry. Please join us at, uh, and become an insider today at njcannabisinsider.biz. We have one little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we were supposed to have Roz McCarthy here uh, the, with uh, Minorities for Medical Marijuana today. Uh, unfortunately, due to a personal emergency, she was not able to attend. Uh, we wish her the best and uh, we'll hope to talk to her soon. Uh, we are joined today though by Leo Bridgewater, who if, you, if you're from New Jersey and in the cannabis space, you know Leo Bridgewater uh, with Minorities for Medical Marijuana and a variety of other groups. Hi, Leo, and we have uh, David Clapper, the CF, uh, CFO with uh, Ethos and the president for the Pennsylvania Operations. Hi, David. Thanks for joining oh, us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Justin. All right. So, uh, Leo, Leo and David, I'll, I'll put this out to you both. The federal cannabis reform has been achingly slow in the United States. Are you optimistic about the current state of, of cannabis right now or not? Where do you stand? Go ahead, Leo. Oh, boy. Okay. So um, I would say, uh, first off, hey, everybody. Um, I would say uh, if you look at the federal side of, the, of government, it's mirroring, it's, it's in the same boat as the uh, state, state, uh, state governments as well. When it comes to the subject of cannabis legalization, matter of fact, let me just, cannabis and hemp legalization. Uh, no matter what state is doing what, when, for instance, New Jersey, whatever they come up with, it's going to have to be fixed from the door, right from its onset. And the reason being is because the subject of hemp and cannabis for these particular bodies are just a little too advanced for these people fresh out. Because, and you know who they are, because they still say things like gateway drug. You see, you, you, you see the whole Safe Banking Act. You see they're, 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 they're going slow with that. Uh, you know who, I, I liken it to having two types of people, Jetsons and Flintstones. And so you know that those folks who are still, um, you know, pussyfooting around when it comes to getting these laws done or being time appropriate, you see it in the urgency or lack thereof and how they, how they uh, move forward with these laws or even how they, how they craft them. I mean, look at New Jersey's ballot question. Look at the way that question is written. Should we tax and regulate a form of marijuana called cannabis? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh! And, we, and we've spoken about this before, and I know that you often use the comparison of, you know, they're on, se you know, we're we're on season four, episode twenty of, of of this right now, and they're just, you know, episode one, <laughs> season, season one. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I'll say on that, Justin, is just looking back over where we've been. One reason I do feel optimistic is if you look at, as some other people have said it, at what happened during the pandemic, in most states where marijuana was legal. It was deemed an essential service. That's progress from where we were just a number of years ago. And, and for that reason, I'm optimistic. All right, well, so you know, speaking to that, what are some of the opportunities and possibilities that you see on the horizon? So one of the things that, um, we are one of the first clinical registrants operating in Pennsylvania. And the clinical registrants are groups that partner with uh, one of the academic medical institutions. We're partnered with Person Health in Philadelphia. Um, one of the areas that we're excited about and that we think is an opportunity in the, uh, on the horizon is continuing to see on the medical side, um, cannabis become a part of healthcare. And one of the things that we haven't seen very much, and, and Justin, this is something you and I have talked about previously, is we haven't seen on the medical side uh, a lot of involvement from the medical community. We think that's something that can and will change. Uh, and we think things like we're seeing in Pennsylvania, where, where the, the medical community is getting involved, in New Jersey, 
Uh, we had seen that uh, some of the draft legislation included a similar uh, type of permit that would include the, the medical schools. That's something that we see as, as a real possibility, a real horizon in, in, the, uh, in the future, is to be able to see continued involvement of the healthcare community, which is going to make it much more accessible for many people. Thank you. Leo, anything to add and when it comes to uh, possibilities and uh, opportunities for, for the cannabis industry? Yeah, well, you know, we, we still have to evolve. I mean, you know, most most cannabis consumers will tell you, you know, the regular folks will tell you that all consumption is medicinal, whether people realize it or not. I mean, if you talk to those who say they recreationally use, if you go be, if you ask them the, the when, the, what, the why, and the how, they actually sound like uh, uh, patients. And so when you look at how we move, uh, again, you know, we were, at first we were non-essential, now we are an essential business. Right. Uh, you know, when you look at, um, as of right now, when you look at the current political, racial climate of this country, and if you look at the current health climate of this country, uh, the entire world and the country now qualifies for a medical marijuana card <laughs> based off of anxiety uh, and post-traumatic stress corona. So. We're talking about, you know, uh, what COVID-19 really did was COVID-19 was the unofficial cutoff for the first generation cannabis entrepreneur, plant touching. That was the cutoff. And the reason why I say that is because it's interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine and he was telling me that uh, he, and he works down at the Department of Health and he's telling me that he's not actually doing his job at the Department of Health. He's actually running, uh, working at a field hospital or no, a testing site now. And so what that means is, is that if you are somebody who was looking to get into the plant touching business of cannabis and hemp in the state of New Jersey, and the only way you could do that is going through the Department of Health, there is nobody at that building to review that application. Why? Because they all, all assets and personnel were divided, were div uh, diverted to COVID something. Right. So there is nobody to, to actually review your application. So it doesn't matter how well you think you know the governor, the governor or how many, how many uh, 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 contacts you think you have, you're not gonna get it, it's not gonna get done. So now- And we also have are, a lawsuit that's slowing down the RFA process. Right, right that, and we walked well, you're into- You're not from New Jersey and familiar yeah. with the regulatory problems. Yeah, and, and we walked into COVID with that going on already. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So that was the official, in my opinion, that was the unofficial cutoff for the first generation. Now that first generation, they're responsible now for building the infrastructure for that first generation workforce, because now we need the worker bees. Mm -hmm. And when you got 60 million people who just applied for unemployment benefits a couple of weeks ago, you know, how, what's the percentage of those people that are gonna have jobs to go back to? And what is the percentage of those people who are going from can of curious to now can of serious? Mm -hmm. So that first generation workforce is actually going to be multi-generational. Mm -hmm. This is July now, and you got grown-ups who are who are who are lifeguards at city pools. Mm -hmm. That's telling you uh, it, it gives you like look at what's happening now. And then on top of that, particularly in this state, and you're gonna hear it in other states as well, our governor just opened up the books and everything, and our budget is short. And so when you talk about how, how are we gonna manage these budget shortfalls, it's, it's this Lincoln, new money too. Would have been a great way to do it, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and Justin, we're not talking about, this is the, 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 the crazy part to me. We are not talking about a grant. We are not talking about a program. We are talking about industry. Mm -hmm. And the fortunate thing for us is that we have a governor who was talking all things science, technology, engineering, and math. And I remember telling the governor one time, if you add A for art, then you, that encompasses the entire cannabis culture, not just the industry. Right. I, and, and that's a big thing here. And again, we're, we're, this is all brand new money that we're talking about. I live in Trenton, New Jersey. And if you go in a 250 square mile radius, of the capital city of New Jersey, you're talking about 27 million people. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking about the fact that 
We live a stone's throw away for the number one cannabis consuming city in the world, New York City, okay? And we have a population of 9 million people and we get 100 million visitors a year. And this entire state, the state of New Jersey, which happens to be the second wealthiest state in the country, is sandwiched between two states that just have medicinal. Now, we're 90, we're, we're, we're three and a half months away from voting for all this and I just now told you just now finding out because if done right in the state of New Jersey, we could leapfrog everybody if we vote for this and go straight to number two behind California in terms of revenue, if mm -hmm. done right. That's a logistical thing that should have been talked about a long time ago, but you got a lot of Flintstones who vilified the making of money so much so that we never talked about it. And now look at us, we in some, we got this pandemic going on, you know, folks is, you know, losing, like, it's, 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 it's interesting. Well, you know, it is New Jersey too. And as you say, mm -hmm. you know, getting it right. Well, there's a first time for everything in New Jersey, right? So, <laughs> uh, so even before COVID disrupted our lives, access mm -hmm. to capital was already a challenge for many mm -hmm. in the cannabis and hemp industries. Now, as public money has dried up, many are facing a, a money crunch. So where does the cannabis industry go from here? I mean, as we see with, you know, companies like Ianthus and, and others, they're facing significant headwinds. Uh, should, are we, you know, going to be seeing a wave of consolidations on, on the horizon? Mm. I, I, uh, Dave, you want to take it? No, go ahead, Leo, and then I'll jump in. Yeah, go ahead first. Okay, so I, I believe that what you are going to see is we know what companies are uh, you, you're like you'll start like right now there's a list of of of, uh, of companies that are not really up to snuff when it comes to uh dealing with social equity and social justice issues and and diversity issues as well that's out right now but we also know those we also know those companies that are uh owned by uh, people of color and so right now, what you need to do is you need to start thinking about, okay, you know what? Now we need to start uplifting those companies that are already here that we know about. So you look at companies like Marion Maine, which is owned by Hope Wiseman, uh, Elevate Cannabis, which is owned by Shayun Adidajay. These are people who are, these are, are people of color who are multi-state operators and who are, and who will, who are willing to, that has a franchise model and who are willing to work with people within that community to help break down those, bar those, those, those barriers to, to, to entry. And so it's now it's about passing or disseminating the information so that folks know where to go and what to do with their money. If there's one thing I will say that the legitimate market has, has done a really terrible job with is understanding that you know, your, 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 your typical cannabis consumer, we're notoriously loyal to a fault. Rarely do we step away from our regular dealer, especially if they got the good stuff and been that if it ain't broke, why, why fix it? Right. Hence why you look at cities like New York, who's the number one cannabis consuming city in the right. world. And they did it with it being illegal. So yeah. if they turn and they have a host of services that the, that the legitimate ministry has not been able to, to meet yet, including delivery yeah. and other. other. And, 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 and Justin, they did it. New York is number one. Karachi, Pakistan is number two. New Delhi, India is number three. Los, Los Angeles is number six. And Chicago is number eight. Mm -hmm. New York and Chicago made one and eight with this being illegal. And I can give you, and let me give you some real boots on the ground intel. I just, cut, I just got an ounce of Gorilla Glue and an ounce of wedding cake for a buck fifty for my guy on the illicit market. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Whereas here in New Jersey, an ounce will cost you four hundred and fifty dollars. Well, so yeah. it's it's so if New York was to actually turn their market inside out from be, from from uh, le uh, legacy to actually legitimate, they're pumping so much cannabis in that city that they that that they could become a city state if they wanted to. That's how much money they pump. That's how much cannabis is being pumped in that city and people are not realizing that and mind you again well maybe if COVID, they're realizing but yeah 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 COVID and COVID COVID ripped us all a brand new one 
So we got to figure out, if, and, 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 and listen, it's going to take everybody to get through this. On top of the fact that education, education, education is going to be a big, 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 big deal. It is. Yeah. One thing I was going to say on that is, is uh, prior to um, this kind of downturn in the, in the economy where multi-state operators traditionally have had a real advantage over small businesses in terms of raising capital because of their size, because they had uh, significant uh, resources themselves and, and relationships. What, what you see now is more of a level playing field, but to the point that a congressman made before and that Poi was talking about quite a bit, to really make, um, uh, to, to really uh, even the playing field, making the ability to access capital um, uh, available to, to, to many more people through something like the Safe Banking Act would be significant. I mean, the, the, when you look at it, and, and you're talking about it, Leo, the amount of capital that's necessary to get into this business, especially if you're going to try to grow, process, it's significant. It's hard for mm -hmm. small business owners in general. And in other industries, where you see that is they're able to do it through SBA money, you know, small business lending, where, where the, the federal government backs it, or it's through banks that have relationships. But here... Uh, when you're trying to do it with uh, capital from private, uh, you know, individuals, worth people, that's very difficult for small businesses. So when you look at it now, I think there is a real opportunity for something like Safe Banking Act to really give people the opportunity to uh, to, 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 to get into some of these opportunities mm -hmm. where you see some of these larger players struggling. Yeah. The fact is, Justin, that you have right now um, – some of the it, it's very difficult for anybody to raise capital um, for, for operations right now. If if you're losing money in your operations, it's very difficult to bring in capital for that. So you see people that are willing to sell kind of non-essential, um, non-essential states, non-essential businesses. Yep. It's a real opportunity for local individuals that know those markets to get in and purchase those. But it it it'd make a significant difference if they had access to, to yep. any kind of uh, any kind of normal capital. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I got a, a, another question uh, following up on uh, David, and it's something that you're very well versed on. Uh, what is the state of cannabis research in the United States and specifically, you know, some of the stuff that your company has been doing? Yeah. So, so as we all know, because of um, the, the classification of marijuana as a Schedule One drug, it's been very difficult to see any kind of significant research in the U.S. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, academic medical institutions that are researching don't have access to grants or if they're getting significantly involved in medical marijuana they run the risk of um, of jeopardizing the federal grants that they get for other areas so yeah. they've had to be very very careful about how and, and what they're researching one of the things that that, that we think could be a significant um uh change to research in the u.s is what we're seeing in this region so uh as we've talked about before justin Pennsylvania was the first state that actually included the medical schools in their program and allowed for certain permittees to operate like any other medical marijuana operator, grow, process, and dispense. But the requirement was that you partner with one of the medical schools for them to perform research. And what that really allows um, to happen is for those, uh, in this case, Jefferson for us, it allows the Jefferson researchers to sit in our dispensary understand what patients are coming in for they can access to their records because they're they're they're, they're uh the, the researchers are treated as one of our employees so they have access to the state system that we have access to they can understand what these people are taking it for they can talk to them about why they're taking it uh and they can really number one collect valid data that they can use for their research uh but it also gives the opportunity for them to do trials where they say uh let's have uh you know 50 uh, patients with GI cancer that are interested in taking medical marijuana to help uh, address their symptoms. Let's compare those to 50 patients that aren't taking medical marijuana and see if the 50 patients that are are able to better withstand the, uh, the, the chemotherapy that's required for you know 12 months of heavy chemotherapy if you have GI cancer. Um, and you can really do what looks and feels like, uh, like trials, like, like uh, um, re real research studies. So 
what's really interesting to me is to see whether Pennsylvania can become a real leader in research. Um, because when you have eight medical schools that are all doing marijuana research, that's significant, right? We haven't seen that anywhere in the U.S. I'd love to see New Jersey become something very similar where uh, the medical schools in New Jersey can get involved with the bill. Um, we've seen that in the uh, in the draft legislation. There was that inclusion for, for the medical schools to be involved. Uh, I think New Jersey uh, could become very similar. Leo, like you're talking about, you look at New Jersey and its proximity to New York and, and Philadelphia has caused New Jersey to be a place as well where you have significant medical schools um, that would love to be involved in, uh, in research. Um, at least as far as we've seen in Pennsylvania, there's a real interest in it. Um, and partnering with groups that are in the industry really allows them to do that. And, and, and what, real quick, one other trend that I'm starting to see, and I'm actually trying my best to help facilitate and make go faster, is to David's point, when it comes to these uh, colleges and universities, now you're starting to see more HBCUs. You're starting to see the That's HBCUs right. make, their, make their presence known. I uh, look at with uh, Dr. Shonda Macias and Alero and them, what they did down in Louisiana, being one of two uh, uh, cultivation license uh, winners. And now they part, and what Alero did was they partnered with Southern University, and now they're producing THC and CBD products in partnership with the university. And so, you know, and, 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 and trying to make that, you know, be a, a, a thing that will actually bear uh, more, you'll start to see more and more and more uh, come online in terms of how do we address, you know, the, uh, the, the, the racial disparity within this industry. Part of that, a, a big part of that, as I alluded to before, and what David said uh, earlier was the educational piece. Yeah, that's right. And when you look at, when you look at uh, HBCUs, hist and those are historically black colleges and universities, you know, um, what that does for those HBCUs is it helps to develop a brand new revenue stream. It also, it also helps to uh, introduce the new talent coming from these HBCUs to the industry. That's right. and, 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 and so what ends up happening is, is that you're start, you're, you'll start to see this synergy where, you know, uh, a lot of this, a lot of the talk in terms of, breaking down those barriers in 20 years aren't, aren't, aren't going to be a thing. And so what is required of people such as ourselves, like David and I, Toy and everything, is that we have to start, this requires us to think three and four generations beyond ourselves. None of us are going to be here to see the penthouse of our work. But what has to happen is that it needs to make sense three, four generations from now. And if it doesn't, there needs to be mechanisms in place so that three, four generations from now, it can make, they can, they can use those mechanisms so that it will make sense then. That is a very difficult thing to do, to get people to think that way when we live in an instant gratification type of society, such as the one we're in now. And so this type of work this type of thinking, even this type of talk as of 2020, July 2020, is shared by just a select few. And 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 that and 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 mind you, again, less than three and a half months, we're three and a half months away from voting for this in a few in a few states, such as like New Jersey. Interesting. Well, as they say in Hamilton, what is a legacy but planting seeds in a garden that you'll never see, right? So mm, mm. Mm. Before, we move on, uh, before we end this, I want to give, uh, we have some great questions that have come in from, uh, from our attendees, and I want to give them an opportunity. From, from Vape John, uh, I'm guessing from, sounds like from uh, South Jersey or, Pens or, or Philadelphia there, how can uh, local people of color at ancillary slash professional services best position themselves to partner and collaborate with cannabis industry stakeholders? Mm. Uh, find the ones that look just like you. That, that like seriously, and and here's the thing: we're out there. I just said Shayun Adida J, Elevate Cannabis, Hope Wiseman with Marion Maine, Dr. Shonda uh, Macias with Alero. You know, these are all these are all multi-state operators, folks who are in the game right now, 
operating, moving, you know, and then there's also, you know, an, check the blacklist. <laughs> that Italian from Can Occlusive with mm -hmm. Mary Pryor and all those, yeah. you know, uh, and then you know what? Also get with organizations like Minorities for Medical Marijuana, whom I happen to be the National Director of Veterans Outreach for, and then look at Women Grow. There are organizations and people out there that are reflective of exactly what it is that you're looking for and can help you. I agree with what Leo is saying. We work with groups like Women Grow to identify uh, different groups we can work with. Leo, like you're saying, uh, identify other groups because there are a lot of groups, even in additional, even ones like us, if we're in New Jersey, they're looking for groups to partner with. Local groups in particular, I think a lot of groups like us like to partner with local groups that have been impacted by this. Um, and, and it's just getting to them and, and knowing who they are and finding the right firms is, is a I, challenge at times. Yeah. I, yeah, you know what, Dave, I just, I just partnered with a, a friend of mine named Sean Wilson, and he's the uh, founder of Vets in the Hood. <laughs> you know, and, and, and listen, there are over 100,000 veterans in the city, in and around the city of Philadelphia alone and are looking to, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it, it, like, we're out there. Yeah. You just, like, what I'm realizing, is, especially with this COVID thing, it's like we got this whole brand new audience. It's like there's all these, there's like all these people. Like when Justin said, like Justin wasn't lying. Me and him laugh about this all the time. Season eight, episode four, day in season one, and Justin be cracking up. But the thing about it is, is that as time goes on and on and on, it ain't funny no more. It ain't so funny because it's like starting to be like for real true, you know. And you're like, oh, like especially when you look, we're not, you know what it is, David and Justin. We're not time appropriate. There's the, 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 the sense of urgency isn't where it needs to be right now. You know, I, I, like with everything that's going on, that, that's where, you know, it's, it's getting crazy for me in terms of our timing and where we are at this time in time. Because there's work that needs to be done. Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple more questions from, from folks before we, we wrap this up. Uh, from Monchery, uh, we have what uh, she asked, what funding sources do you recommend for startup family owned uh, for a startup family owned dispensary, especially during these times and potentially located in Chicago? I'll jump on that really quickly. Um, uh, Justin and then Leo would love to hear your thoughts, too. We actually have partnered with um, five uh, uh, minority owned um, opportunity applicants in Illinois, um, specific to that, some of the things that Toy was talking about. And, and part of what we, we identified groups that, that were looking for expertise to help them on their application, looking for capital, um, and then took a minority position in their business to um, lend money to them, to be able to um, help them with their application. Because as you've talked about, we talked about uh, previously, it's difficult to compete with some of those multi-state operators that have done applications in state after state after state, yeah. know, how to, know how to write it, know how to, to, to find real estate. Um, so we identified five different uh, applicants um, and specifically partnered with them to help them uh, file an application. We didn't, we didn't apply on our own. We, we, we thought it was uh, much more appropriate to partner with some of these, um, these, uh, um, empowerment applicants. And uh, so, so Justin, I think there are other groups that have focused on that. I think you would raise the question to us previously, you know, are, are there groups that are, that are just putting minorities or women on their ap applications to, 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 to get points? And, and I think the answer is, I think there yeah. are groups um, specifically yeah. like what we're doing, where we're saying, you know what, this is the right thing to do. Let's find minority applicants that have um, yeah. a real interest in this industry and back them. Yep. I, I would say, uh, specifically when it comes to Illinois, uh, one group that I would, I would actually take a very hard look at is uh, a group led by uh, Chris Crane and, and Forefront Ventures. Um, yep. and, 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 and listen, um, Chris, Chris, that's my boy. That's my man, 50 grand. I love that dude. And the reason being is because if you check his resume, if you look at the work, the actual work that they're putting in, especially like him, It'll blow your mind. It, 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 there's no question about what his, what his uh, 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 dedication to it at all is. The second thing I would say is 
I actually sit on the advisory board for the Cannabis World Congress Business Expo, the CWCBE. And one thing I will give that that platform is that they've gone, they, they've taken these types, this subject matter, they've been talking about this stuff for years and actually allowing activists and people of color on that platform to be able to showcase what it is that they can do and the possibilities. It's, it's how you're able to see the industry and in physical carnage alongside those names that we just, that me and David have been throwing out there. That's the way, that's where you can find us, especially at those expos like CWCB Expo. And uh, you got to, you, you know, so that's, it's, it's the exposure and that's knowing right. where to find those people. That's right. Well, Leo and David, thank you so much for, for uh, the conversation today. This has been fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. But folks, folks who have joined us, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Today's uh, uh, conversation webinar will end up being, uh, will become available on uh, the event Slack channel, and you'll be able to view it on uh, uh, YouTube when we syndicate it. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Uh, thanks especially to our keynote speaker, Congressman McGovern, and all of our panelists and our local sponsor, the B. Gill Group. Uh, for this event, NJ Cannabis Insider and our partner with advanced uh, local sister media groups across the country. Um, so thank you all for, for everything you've done to contribute and to the conversation and to you know, keep everything going uh, with, with respect to this. The Times... Just because pan, uh, the pandemic has put a pause on many things in, in the industry and in the economy doesn't mean that the conversation has to stop. Again, thank you all for joining us. I hope you had a, a good time uh, as much as we did. Bye.